Who is that guy or that girl from your office, and what did they do to earn that title? I'll start. Story one. A guy at my work, let's call him Roger, claimed you can get high-octane racing fuel by mixing 89-octane and 93-octane gas in your tank. Roger told me on my first day here seven years ago that if I wanted to know any good Asian massage parlors nearby, he'd recommend the good ones with the happy endings. First day at work. He used to watch webcam girls from the Philippines on his desktop at work. Stripping, doing other unsavory things, etc. Then he went over and married one, and now she lives here. She's half his age and probably less than half his size. He took a Filipino co-worker to see his buddy's band at a local bar. Turns out it was a biker bar frequented by a lot of some kind of Aryan nation-style bikers. The co-worker told me that there were signs up extolling the virtues of white supremacy, and that everyone was glaring at him the entire time he was in the bar. When he pointed it out, Roger just laughed and said, I come here all the time, it's no big deal. Roger snores through meetings. Roger at one time had some kind of narcolepsy or something and would fall asleep in his cube. Co-workers frequently threw things at him to wake him up. The weird thing is, he's actually a pretty nice guy. If you got arrested or something and called him at 3 a.m. to come bail you out, he'd do it, even if he'd only met you once for like 10 minutes. He's very friendly and sociable. He's just really strange. Story two. Used to work with a guy who was an excellent engineer but frequently subject to fits of rage when things didn't go well with what he was working on. Picture the scene. Typical cubicle farm with engineers hard at work, and the only sound you hear is the sound of tapping on keyboards. Suddenly the sound of hysterical angry cursing and someone slamming their keyboard on the desk repeatedly. Everyone leaps to their feet in alarm like a coterie of prairie dogs scanning the room for the source of the noise. Almost at once, everyone realizes that it's just Tim having another tantrum, smiles at each other and quietly sits back down. Later, our secretary walks over to his office with a new keyboard, puts it on his desk without a word, and then walks back. Story three. That guy at my current company is John. John is a conspiracy theorist. He believes that the anti-theft RFID things at the doors of Walmart are designed to scan your credit cards and the metal strip in money in your wallet to see how much money you have to spend. John talks about secret CIA trains that run in tunnels under the city. John used to work for a cell phone company and tells us stories of how he installed scanners on light poles on nearly every major road to scan for a unique identifier that all vehicles emit for government tracking purposes. John believes the building we work in has chemicals applied to HVAC system, which is making us more compliant with government programs. John will never use his ATM card to buy meals because he doesn't want the government to track what he eats. John calls a $20 bill a yuppie meal coupon. I actually thought that one was funny. Ice cream is called whipped lard. Eating at Panda Express is eating an endangered species meal. John once told me about his collection of different sized rubber gloves he has at home. He has a pair that go up to his shoulders for cleaning the bathroom. Sadly, John quit a few months ago. On the day he quit, he sat in his car in the parking garage for four hours before he worked up the guts to call his boss on the phone and quit. He instructed that his desk be boxed up and sent to his home. No one has heard from John since. Edit. Just thought of some more. John also believed that all major leaders of the world belong to the same family tree. Also, our building has anti-earthquake devices attached to it, so the building shakes gently every so often. John claimed that the shakes were the CIA shooting mind control beams up from their underground trains. John believes our secretary at the front desk keeps a log of when John entered and left the building. Most days, John would ride the train to work, and every so often he would say, Better stay indoors, they are spraying again. Spraying mind control suites, that is. Edit, too. I forgot to mention that he made custom tin foil hats that he used to sell on the web. Unfortunately, I don't have a link. He also made jester hats with detachable bells so you could wash them without the bells getting rusty from the water. Story four. My good friend Paul works in the warehouse at our company. He's gotten into every sort of trouble imaginable. He tipped a towering stack of construction materials over the back of our yard's wall. He slammed the forklift into one of our delivery trucks when he dozed off. He's gone to the wrong construction site a hundred miles away from the intended delivery site. But he's a genuinely good-hearted guy, and the company's had mercy on him. He's still with us. Tons of funny stories always coming out of the warehouse from this guy. The highlight, Paul's an Iron Maiden fan, and he's always singing while he works. Well, one day, Paul decides to sing a parody version of Caught Somewhere in Time with the clever lyrics of Caught with Shaft in Hand. 
so he's just belting these inappropriate lyrics out as he moseys over towards the will call counter. Who should walk in but one of the sales directors, giving a tour of the warehouse to a new female salesperson? Paul rounds the corner, contioning the chorus with, Cat with shaft and ha and bumps into the sales director. He plays if off like nothing happened, shakes his hand and the hand of the new employee, who are both giving him odd looks. To add to the hilarity, when they finally depart, we notice his fly's been down the entire time. Story five. I'm not even sure where to start. We have that family working in our warehouse. It's a mother and her son and daughter. The son was recently fired for reasons that I will get to in a moment. They are as white trash as you can possibly be. Think of all the stereotypes and you will have thought of them. So here's the laundry list. The mother. Married to a guy that has dementia and 13 stints in his heart. They have filed medical bankruptcy three times. Most recently, her husband tried to terminate himself, but ended up only shooting himself in the shoulder. She always wears t-shirts with sayings that she thinks are clever like, God don't make no trash, and my give a oh no is busted. To really put the icing on the white trash cake, she smokes Paul Malls. She and her children commute to work together, but every other month their car gets repossed, so they end up getting a new poor vehicle. No one is sure how they pull that off, what with all the bankruptcies and other bad credit issues. She watches every reality show and wants to talk about them with anyone who will listen and doesn't understand when you tell her that you don't watch whatever it is she's talking about. So you think you can dance as a prime example. The daughter. She smoked through all four of her pregnancies, claiming that her mother smoked when she was pregnant with her, and she turned out fine. She lives in a trailer but gets pissed if you call it a trailer because it's on a permanent foundation. She has a Tourette's-type head twitch and blinking thing going on, kind of like Jose Canseco. Come to think of it, she sort of looks like Canseco. She has no neck, just a head that suddenly becomes shoulders. She is constantly broke, but spends every available penny on sending her two daughters to beauty pageants, and then makes everyone in the company look at the pageant photos. Surprisingly, they have actually won a few. I would hate to see what the rest of the competition look. We know she has some sort of psychosis because she has to be medicated at all times. If not, she sees and hears cow that isn't there. This has led to her hiding under her desk, screaming and crying. She also has some other medical condition that causes her to always to be on her period. We know this because she makes us uncomfortable by talking about it all the time. Once, her husband showed up at our office, and while he was waiting for her, he told us that if he had known how crazy she was, he would have never married her, let alone had kids. To boot, she has four wiener dogs, one of which, she claims, is an attack dog that actually fended off a burglar. It was a very elaborate story that ended with a wiener dog launching himself off of the couch and into the burglar's face drawing blood. No one was apprehended, so if you see anyone with the telltale signs of weenie dog attack, please notify the authorities. The son. He always has the worst gas known to man. He was inside of a shipping container unloading products with some of our other employees when he kept farting, which ultimately made them all throw up. It was ghastly. While talking to him one day, he stuck his hand down the back of his pants and said, watch this. He then stuck his finger under his mom's nose and told her to sniff. He apparently stuck his finger in his peach because his mom threw up. He then repeated the process with his sister before she could be warned. He had to miss a month of work due to a riding lawnmower explosion. He claimed he had been blowed up. He lives in a trailer on his mom's property, but doesn't have electricity, so they just run extension cords from her trailer. He had a boil on his arm that was believed to be a staph infection, and his mother lanced it with a box cutter. It was disgusting. He had a habit of wrecking our forklift and one day drove it off the loading dock. The forks went into the asphalt about 10 inches, and we had to get a special wrecker to come pull it out. A short time after that, he backed into one of the support beams in the warehouse, knocking it completely out from under the roof. The beam was at least 30 feet long, and it's amazing that no one was injured. Sometimes I would find him sleeping, hidden behind pallets in our warehouse during work hours. Eventually, his sister ratted him out for being drunk on the job all the time, which explained all the forklift mishaps. When confronted by his mother about the drinking, he went crazy and tried to beat her and his cider with a baseball bat. Other employees intervened and we called the cops. He took off on foot and was apprehended later that day, vowing to get even with all of us for calling the cops. His mom didn't want us to call them, but what the fudge ever. He was wielding a bat. Needless to say, he doesn't work here anymore. There is so much more, but those are just some of the highlights that I can think of off the top of my head. Story six. I worked at a mine in northern Manitoba. One of the old miners was a guy named Jack Bones, not made up. Jack was known for having the largest banana around. 
Every night when the miners come up from underground, they shower before going home in large open shower rooms. Whenever there was a new rookie working there, Jack would make a point of showering beside him. He would lather up his privates with soap and then proceed to use a huge floor scrubbing brush to scrub his banana, thereby giving himself a huge boner and stand as close as possible to the rookie. On several occasions, the guys just never returned. Story 7. At my last job, we had a couple. I'll go with the one story that translates best to type, so we'll call him Kurt. If Kurt wasn't boy, then he had everyone in the company fooled. No one cared, mind you. It's just an important detail to this story. He was regularly referred to as a bad person. Kurt was the kind of guy that would pick a target and then very openly flirt with that guy for a while. It didn't matter how straight, married, or uninterested you were, Kurt was going to get his flirt on. When my one friend grew a goatee, Kurt went up to him and said something along the lines of, Ooh, I like this, and stroked his face. Another time, my other friend was in the kitchen heating up his lunch when Kurt walked in. I was in earshot of the kitchen, so I heard this all going on. First, Kurt asks him to get his lunch from the fridge for him. Naturally, it's on the bottom shelf, and my friend, being the unconditionally nice person he is, obliged. I'm already laughing so hard for the blatant and stereotypical office-close relationship harassment situation, but then Kurt took it to a whole other leveling, proving he's a pro. Now he has to explain why he's unable to bend over and get his own lunch. It's because his testicles are swollen to the size of grapefruits. The graphic description is accompanied with hand gestures down by his groin to give a really solid visual. Kurt went on for no less than five minutes talking about how big and sensitive his balls are. It was glorious. My poor friend is too nice to just say gross dude and walk away, so he's trying to walk away with lunch in hand without being a banana. By the time he got back to his cube, I had tears in my eyes and my face was red from trying not to laugh out loud. This has set the bar as greatest thing I've seen in a professional environment. Story 8. That guy at our place was Pete. He was great. He was a chronic liar. It got so bad we actually started writing down the things he did. To be fair, some of these things happened, but most are things he claims. 1. Pete has a property empire consisting of 24 houses too. Pete will sell his houses in 10 years and make 1 million pounds 3. Pete is an airline pilot. 4. Pete used to be a courier and made 1,000 pounds a week and retired due to stress 5. He used to have a wireless ISP in the South 6. He has a further 36 houses, 7. He once beat up someone and the police turned up and thanked him. 8. Pete used to have a Rover 600. The 1.8 liter engine was so powerful he would regularly win street races with it. It is now sat in a garage in Bristol for when he needs it. 9. Pete was a lorry driver, 10. Pete is a volunteer custody inspector for the police. 11. Pete now has 64 houses. 12. Pete once threw a punch at someone, missed, cracked the wall, and knocked a brick out. 13. Some kids stole his scooter once, then he found them and broke their knees. 14. He now says he found them in the pub, bought them a drink so they knew he knew. 15. Pete spent 10 years as a DJ for Radio Bristol 16. Pete runs a webcam website describing himself as a censored photos king xcams.com. Whenever one of his girls cams with someone he makes £3.17, he used to be Scott Mills PA at Real Radio 18. Pete is an officially ordained priest, 19. He has a Class 2 license for lorries. They are apparently very easy to turn 20. Pete belongs to Martial Arts Fight Club and has tournament training on Wednesday nights 21. When there was a forum post about blood donations, Pete managed to end the thread with this gem. I'm not sure if I should go. The last time I went, they took one half a pint and told me it was being thrown away as it was no good. So I haven't bothered since, and that was about 13 years ago, 22. Pete's wife was made redundant from the nursery she worked at, so Pete bought it. 23. Pete once came into work after his karate fight club championship and ripped a tracksuit from ankle to crotch. He offered to show us how far the rip went. 24. Pete grew up five doors down from Tony Robinson. 25. Pete told us the domain name for TNT, the delivery company, was about to expire. He said he nearly got it, but they renewed it before it expired. He said he would sell it back for one million pounds. 26. When he was a lorry driver, he terminated several students by knocking them down. This was also a well-known area for to the Sky students who failed their exams. 27. We pointed out to Pete his trousers were falling down. Pete said it was because he had lost four stone in the one and a half weeks, but looked exactly the same. 28. 
and a night shift he was talking all night about he was going to London to visit his friend Lacey Turner from EastEnders. He even called her and was heard leaving a voicemail saying, Hi, it's my Pete Lacey love, I'll be there soon, etc. 29. On another night shift, Pete was talking about his wife and ended up talking about how they were splitting up because she couldn't satisfy him sexually. 30. Without fail, Pete always downloads a terabyte of data a month. Story 9. Our guy only recently got fired. One of the conclusions we had eventually reached about him was that he was completely incapable of feeling empathy, which is not really the best person to have as your main customer support representative. But that was what he had been hired to be. He was mostly frightening in that position because he never stopped smiling or being cheerful, even if the customer was freaking out at him or he was bored out of his mind. This in itself doesn't call for alarm, but he was a strange dude. Asterisk. On his second week in the office, he found out that there weren't any dentists that provide ozone therapists in our city, so he took two days off and drive to a nearby city in order to get his teeth ozoned. Asterisk. He would ask, How was your weekend? In the most interested voice you could imagine, inflection perfect with Tobias Funka asking, How are you? You could tell him, sure, with him exploding into laughter at every event that happened, no matter what it was. If you asked him how his weekend was, he would be extremely sure it was a great weekend, but then wouldn't be able to recall exactly what he did. Ever. Asterisk. After a month of working there, he started complaining that our insurance company, which he wouldn't receive benefits for until he had been there for three months, didn't cover his ozone therapy. Asterisk. He kept a steamer crockpot thing in the break room and steamed a mixture of carrots and spinach every single morning, which he would then eat out of a bowl at around 10 a.m. The smell was atrocious and everyone complained about it the first day he did it until we found out someone was making that horrible smell on purpose. He called it borscht for unknown reasons, which our Russian salesman nearly flipped out over every time the word came up. Asterisk. He was kind of an idiot when it came to support as well. We have a support ticket system that handles all of our clients for all of the different services we offer. He actually had copy pasta that he was putting into every single ticket with a lot of idiotic troubleshooting steps that didn't apply to 75% of our clientele. When someone called in to report our support center was down, asterisk, he asked them to submit a support ticket about it, asterisk, asterisk. He overall was a bit of a know-it-all, being very good at selling clients things that they didn't need, and would later complain they spent thousands of dollars on. By the time he was fired, clients would call in and immediately ask to be forwarded to sales, even for stupid support issues, just so they wouldn't have to talk to him. He's not as bad as some people's that guy. But by the time he was fired, everyone in the office was being driven up the wall. Our number of support tickets submitted this past month are at 50% of what they were last year, after a steady increase for the rest of the year, and I'm fairly certain it's his fault. Edit, another thing that is completely inexcusable. We had, as I stated, a Russian salesperson. Let's say his name was Boris. Boris had a bit of an accent, but had lived in America for most of his life. He pronounced his name, or at least his name in this parallel example, Boris. Support guy insisted on it being Boris. We were all too polite to correct him, but he asterisk knew asterisk it was wrong. He knew it. Because once, by coincidence, I laughed at something on my computer just after support guy said Boris. Immediately, support guy says, oh, I pronounce it that way because that's the proper way to say it. Out of nowhere, he says this. And on the subject of Boris, support guy spelled his name Boris. No idea why. Two R's. He was corrected every single time. Sorry, I forgot. Support guy worked there for seven months. Seven months of too many R's. Story 10. I doubt anybody will see this as late as I am, but I feel compelled to share. Don't discount that guy too quickly. An old friend of mine used to share stories about a co-worker that would always say and do wildly inappropriate things, much along the lines of the OP's examples, and including picking food off said friend's plate in the break room. Uninvited, of course. My friend was nice to the guy anyway despite the annoyances, and considered him a friend. Anyway, long story short, my friend passed away suddenly one day after he'd quit his job with that guy a while back. The guy was on his Facebook friends and ended up producing quite an outpouring of feelings and sympathy with the family and friends of the deceased. He would note every time he drove by my friend's old house or anything, and not obnoxiously, but in a very genuine and caring way. He was very kind and supportive to all of us that were grieving. He obviously was a very caring and friendly individual, just totally socially inept. The moral of the story? 
Some of those guys are just totally weird, but some are actually really nice people that just don't know how to interact well. Give them a chance and you might make an invaluable friend for life and death. This guy was far more loyal than the trite, normal people my friend had worked with, some of which made brief and non-sentimental remarks on his death. That guy seemed to be the only one that was really, truly affected by it. Story 11. Several jobs ago, we had know-it-all guy who, no matter the context, had a story. This included the time when we were discussing with some Russian engineers what it meant to stand in a food line. Know-it-all guy tried to answer the question. We're all like, dude, when the frick were you in a Russian food line? Shut up and let him answer. Favorite, though, had to be the discussion of where to go for lunch. The discussion included a couple of H-1B guys who were quite literally straight over from India. The idea of an Indian restaurant came up. The food at that place is no good, they said. Yes, it is, said Know-It-All Guy, who I think had been the one that suggested the place. Not really, no, they said in that polite way and suggested other places. Know-It-All Guy dismisses other places. No, really, this place is the closest to the real authentic Indian food. Finally, I had enough and said, Know-It-All Guy, listen. These guys, asterisk, were just there a month ago, asterisk. They lived there all their lives. When they say that something is just like mom used to make, they mean it. We're going to take their opinion on this one. Story 12. I've got one. Among other things, he, asterisk, insisted that UPS trucks can't go in reverse. We told him that that was ridiculous, but he insisted. He wouldn't let it drop until we actually called UPS to ask. Their reaction was fantastic. Asterisk always bragged about how his girlfriend was a virgin before she met him, but also bragged about how he was the best she'd ever had. Asterisk, he eventually married this girl. After which he once said, and I quote, She's my property, and I own her. Asterisk insisted that the speed limit inside the facility that we worked was 10 miles per hour, while standing next to a sign that said 15 miles per hour. When this was pointed out to him, he said that the sign was wrong. Asterisk. Once told us that the Spanish channel, a U.S. channel, by the way, was broadcast from Brazil, a Portuguese-speaking country. His proof? His Hispanic wife told him so. She didn't even speak Spanish. He got very angry when this was pointed out to him. Story 13. I was a stripper in an all-nude club in West Virginia for four years. It was a nice inside. However, it was located behind a truck stop. As you can imagine, that place attracted a large number of those girls. One of them, my friend and I refer to as Dumb Erika. We had a few friends named Erika at the time, and we didn't want anyone to get confused. She had an okay body, but her face looked like a female version of Robert Englund, wearing four pounds of blue eyeshadow. And dumb as a box of hair. Dumb Erika, yes, that's how she spelled it, had the worst lisp. It wouldn't have been so bad, but she was prone to say things like, I'm thicker than her. I'm the star of the bar. I heard that she would tell people outside of work and thought she was a sort of local celebrity. She entered Miss Hawaiian Tropic, a beauty contest that a lot of strippers enter, and came back to work telling everyone she had won, even though the results were listed in the newspaper and it was pretty obvious that she didn't win. She had no idea that being a stripper may not be an acceptable subject with every person that she came into contact. I ran into dumb Irika at the grocery store while shopping with my mom and she introduced herself as... The erotic, exotic Irika. My mom did not know I was a stripper at the time, and as a stripper, you should always assume that when you see a co-worker with someone who might be their parent. The next day, Irika showed up to work with a decal across the top of her car windshield that said, Erotic Irika. That's when I really freaked out, because it occurred to me that she was able to successfully pass the driver's exam. Dumb Irika didn't know how to use a tampon. I tried to explain it, using the material provided in the box, but was unsuccessful. Because you can't take a week per month off from work, inserting a tampon and learning to tuck in the string is an incredibly important skill to have when working in an all-nude club. Anyway, it's pretty normal to have someone check your hoo-ha right before you go on stage for any toilet paper remnants, lint, strings, etc. that might glow bright blue in the black light. That is embarrassing. She has me check to make sure her string is tucked in one day. She bends over and her tampon string is not out. Half of the tampon is hanging halfway out of her vagina. And she can't tell if it's showing or not. She was getting called out to dance, so I told her to maybe leave her underwear on for this one as she was walking out on stage. I walk out onto the floor and all the guys were staring at the stage with funny looks on their faces. There she is, first song, legs spread, with her glowing tampon flapping in the breeze. She did that all the time. Another time I tried to talk to her about her tampon issue. It was scaring away customers. 
She looked me in the eye and said, if they ask me what it is, I just tell them it is the poothy gloth tick and they believe me. Ain't that great? I don't think anyone believed her. Later I found out that she had a twin. Story 14. Years ago I worked retail at the Sharper Image. Paul was another sales guy who had really phenomenal genetics. He was in his late 30s and looked to be in his 20s, contrasted by another 24-year-old co-worker who looked 40. Anyway, Paul lived with his wealthy parents and aspired to nothing more than going out clubbing after work. He was not particularly smart, but very well off. One time, Paul apparently lost his cell phone at a club. He didn't bother reporting it or anything and later got a $4,000 bill. We had a dehumidifier for sale on display. On a slow day, we convinced Paul to drink the water out of the dehumidifier. Our manager found out later and just sighed, shaking his head and muttering, Paul, story 15. That guy was named Bill, and here were a few things he did in his first week. Asterisk upon finding out a temp was a dancer says, Oh, you must be part of Alvin Ailey, an African-American dance company in NYC. She was black, so to him there must be no other dance company she would be part of. Asterisk. After hearing I received straight A's in my post-grad classes that semester, said, You typical Asian in front of the vice chairman of the company. Asterisk asked a pregnant co-worker whether they went through IVF because her husband or her were the one who had the problem in front of about five of us while she was sitting at her cubicle. Like I said, that was his first week. Story 16. I used to work construction with a meth addict named Randy. He was childhood friends of the owner and his co-owner brother, the both of whom did not have the heart to fire the guy. Besides nearly terminating me and a co-worker daily, it was iron work, so heavy cow plus high up plus crackhead equal sign a very hazardous environment, there's this gem of a story. I had to pick him up for work every day, which meant a half-hour drive to his trailer before an hour and a half drive in the other direction. Commuting this long for a construction gig means a 4 a.m. wake-up. One day, I am just too, oh no, exhausted to drive, and against my better judgment, let him drive from his place. His only stipulation was that we take his car. I fall asleep immediately, figuring if he got into an accident, I'd rather pass away in my sleep. I was woke a few times by a few reckless turns, and by the end of the trip really regretted the decision as it entailed a return trip with the maniac. We finish our shift eight hours later and get in the car, only to drive five minutes before he spots a police cruiser behind him. Oh, cow, don't do anything funny. Huh, why, just drive, it will be fine. Lights and siren fire up. Fudge, I told you. Uh... Cop, license and registration, Randy. Well, officer, see my hands are up and empty. I'm just gonna step out the car because I don't have a license me. What, you banana? You said it was fine that you drove today. That implies that it's legal, cop. Sir, tell your passenger to remain in the vehicle and step outside. 30 minutes later, cop. Do you have a license, son? Me. Yes, sir. Is it all right that I drive this car home? Cop. It would be, but unfortunately it's not registered, so we're impounding it. Can you call someone to get you? After that, I had to wait three hours for my boss to even leave to come get me, plus the drive for him up, and then ride back down with him, totaled about six hours of sitting at a bench in a podunk town in upstate NY, because it didn't even have the decency to have a bar for me to have a few beers at. That's why he was that guy. Story 17. At my job, that guy believes every single conspiracy theory that ever existed. He seems to think that the stranger, more outlandish explanation for anything is often the correct one. 911 was an inside job. We never went to the moon. Free energy exists and is being kept secret by big oil. The government is knowingly poisoning its soldiers by forcing them to use depleted uranium bullets. He's shown me a YouTube video he uploaded of a picture of Saturn where the camera just zooms in on a certain spot where there is a couple of straight lines. He says these lines are evidence that some kind of man-made structure has been built there. He discovered this by himself, which means he must be meticulously poring over images of other planets for some sign of life. One of our more recent arguments was about tectonic plates, what causes earthquakes and how continents move over time. He says tectonic plates don't exist, and explain to me something called even though this theory is old and has been rejected by the scientific consensus, he still subscribes to it. I used to argue with the guy often about all his crazy theories, but after a while I realized that you can't really argue with crazy and now I just nod my head and smile. Story 18. At my old job there was a girl named Shelley. 
I had been there for about a year and a half when she was hired, working as keyholder, assistant manager, optician of a very small, two doctors, two opticians, one other employee, private optometry practice. The practice itself was owned by a husband and wife. The husband worked at the store I was in while the wife had a store up in NY. She was allegedly a friend of the other employee, a kind of mousy Colombian girl who was sweet, if a bit naive and adverse to working. Initially, Shelley was asterisk, kind asterisk of a unpleasant, which was fine. Apparently, they'd hired her on as a manager or something, despite the fact we didn't need one, and she was trying to throw her weight around. It was annoying, but life goes on. She starts getting really close to the owner of the store, oftentimes going into the office and closing the door for meetings, which, uh, seemed kind of shady, because when you combine that sort of secrecy for the puppy eyes they were giving each other, it's obvious what's going on. From there, they got really touchy. We have cameras, not sure why they do that. And she started taking money out of the register while the owner gave her permission. For a store pulling in maybe $800 a day, taking $100, 200 of that money was pretty poor. We stopped getting commission around that time. She was also just really lazy and rude to the customers, so much so that we had a bunch of them who would refuse to see her. Giving discounts and good service to her friends is one thing, but charging everyone else like crazy to make up for it. No. After about four months of this, the owner's wife comes in and asks me point blank what's going on. I tell her it isn't my place, but, well, it is what it is. Apparently, the owner's wife finally called some of her old employers, and it turns out that Shelley runs this kind of scam all the time. She gets hired, gets cozy with someone in charge, and then cries assault for money slash gifts slash etc. She got a bunch of clothes from another store this way, and a BMW too, which kind of blew my mind. The next day, Shelly got fired because, and I quote, I'm not paying you to fudge my husband. Story 19, oh sweet Jesus. This is probably gonna end up buried, but I need to get it off my chest anyway. I used to work at a women's clothing store. One of my first shifts, I was closing with a young supervisor. She seemed okay until the manager left. Then she sat on the floor, took out her phone, and started texting people. Whatever, we weren't busy. After about 20 minutes of this, she suddenly stops texting, looks at me, and asks me if I'm okay with close relationship stuff. I didn't really know what she meant at first, so I just kind of shrugged and tried to keep myself busy. She asks me again, only the second time she actually elaborates and asks me if I'm okay with talking about close relationship. Once again, first time I've ever met her. Being the new girl... I didn't want to rock the boat, so I tell her that, yeah, close relationship talk doesn't bother me. Because it doesn't do, I prefer to talk about it with close friends in less of a work environment. Yeah, but whatever. Wrong move. As soon as I tell her I'm okay with close relationship talk, she starts loudly talking about how she recently had close relationship with a friend of hers, and now she has chlamydia. This was her favorite topic of discussion for the next four weeks or so. Her chlamydia. She made it total common knowledge. She even told some of our customers, which two of us found out one afternoon, when an older woman approached us and asked us if we could help her instead because that girl over there won't stop talking about her STDs. Story 20. I work with an appliance salesman named Henry. Henry is a 60-year-old Colombian dude from Miami that talks fast and with a stammer. He's five foot nothing, about 200 pounds, and looks like George Costanza. Henry clogged the toilet and it overflowed. He then asked me to get a mop and clean it up. I'm not the janitor and fudge, no. Constantly tells customers he's telling the truth about an appliance and price and says that he is not working on commission. He just loves helping people get what they want. He is on commission. He adds warranties and overpriced cleaners to customers' orders without telling them, and 70% of the time the customers don't notice because they're spending 20 to 30 grand anyway. He's in the top 10 in the company in accessory sales. He stammers a lot especially when he gets defensive. He coaches a high school boys basketball team on the weekends and wears this gaudy championship ring on his finger like he's Phil Jackson. Oh, and his kids don't even go to that school. Never have. A black woman asked him for assistance, and he said, I'll be right with you, sister. Everyone does an impression of him. He blames others for his mistakes. He bought an 18-year-old Lexus, it is Cherry, from his neighbor to replace his 20-year-old SUV. He drives that thing around like he's the cow parks really far from everyone else for fear of someone touching it, and constantly informs people that he drives a luxury car. Oh, you have a BMW? I drive a Lexus myself. Great handling. 
He recently started riding the bus because he claims it's more relaxing for his 30-mile commute. We all suspect that something broke on the Lexus. He threw a pan on the floor. We have promotional pans and knife sets and yelled, Bam! There's your freebie to a customer. He calls people dude and bro. Always talks about his P90X that he's doing. It's been 10 months and he looks the same. Refers to Asians as Orientals. Story 21. There is a man at the grocery store I work at. We will call him Monty because that is his name. I hate this man. He embodies everything that is wrong with society and fills so many stereotypes it isn't even funny. One, he is from New Jersey. Therefore, in his mind, me must be a mobster. He acts this way all the time to everyone. Heavy Brooklyn accent, even though he has never been to New York, self-admitted. Unnecessarily argumentative and overly confrontational about anything. Two, he acts like people asking him to do things like his job is an affront to him on par with assaulting his mother or kicking the Pope in the balls. Three, this man is built like a three-quarters full sack of nonsense with thinning hair, zero charisma, and yet he still hits on the female minors we have working here. Did I mention this man is about 70 years old? Four, he once threatened to bring a gun in to work and shoot up the joint and you to zero motha. That last bit is a direct quote from him I said to my manager when I reported it. And somehow he still works there. Story 22. Easily, Dater. He was this German designer in our office. He was absolutely bonkers. He was in our office, but not in my department. It's kind of unusual for people to be in different department areas. Also note that this is a big corporation, not like an independent studio. So one day I'm working and I hear someone come into my cube. It's Dater. He starts dancing suggestively and rubbing his body all over. We never really think about how it feels for our body to move. We just sit here all day. And he starts gyrating and undulating. I say nothing and turn back around. Then I heard him go to the other cubes and do the same thing. Mind you, this wasn't even his department. One day he came in dressed in full lederhosen. There was no reason for this. It was not Halloween or Oktoberfest. He came into my cube and started dancing a jig. I ignored him again and he went around to the other cubes. Story 23. This probably won't get seen, but whatever. I used to work brick and block masonry in college. My boss hired a lot of college students because the pay was low and the work was hard, and I ended up having a string of friends work there over the years. During the hotter days of summer, we would all have short tempers because, let's face it, working in 100 degrees Fahrenheit heat and 85% humidity sucks. Anyway, this brings me to Ronnie Asterisk. Ronnie always had the worst luck. He always managed to screw things up. At the time, everyone would get pissed off, but now it's funny as hell. Some things he's done. Asterisk spilled wheelbarrows full of mortar mix, making it unusable. Asterisk smacked things with planks he was carrying. Like in the cartoons, I think he hit someone once. One of the things he knocked over was an expensive, a highly precise instrument used to make sure the wall is level. Ours was about $600. He also took forever to do tasks. Asterisk. We had a brick saw that one had to unlock before one could lower the... He frequently forgot that step and would cut a very shallow piece of the brick, flip it over and try to cut more, over and over. Boss said, I need that cut, Ronnie. Fine, I'll cut my hand off. Asterisk boss asked him to cut a sheet of tar paper with a box cutter. Ronnie was taking a long time, so boss says, where's that cut? R, it's coming. Hold on, B, use the sharp end. Laughing, B, there is no sharp end. Asterisk boss asked him to go get the henway out of the truck box. It's a common trick for the new guys. They're supposed to ask, what's a henway? And we answer, what's a henway? Oh, about three, four pounds. Ronnie didn't even ask what it was. He just went looking. After about 30 minutes, boss finally tells him he doesn't need it anymore. We were all dying laughing the whole time. I have so many more fond memories from that job. Story 24. There was this guy named Dave. Dave had two lazy eyes and smoked a lot of crack. He would constantly talk about his wife's genitalia, usually referring to it as that fat old monkey hanging down there when she bends over and insisted that you can't hurt that cat. She done had six kids. Then we found a crack pipe in the toilet, and Dave looked like the saddest cross-eyed dog you'd ever seen. We used to play a game called Make Kyle Say Ouch, whereby the goal was pretty much explained in the title. Dave decided that he would win once and for all by shoving Kyle off of the loading dock with a pallet jack one night, and this guy named Powder chased him up a stack of boxes. Then Mike, the red-headed middle-aged thug, 
who took caffeine pills and pretended to tweak on them and listened to ICP all God oh no night. Then there was Mike, the manager, who wore a different DBZ shirt every flipping day and had no God, oh no idea that it was even a TV show. How he came across these shirts I will certainly never know. Story 25. I used to work at Best Buy right out of high school, selling appliances in a forgotten corner of the store where everyone goes to steal things. Fridge Isle provides some nice visual coverage when opening DVD cases. It's pretty well-known fact that Best Buy only employs the finest of the finest when it comes to morons. But this guy acted like he had no clue how to interact with people. Asterisk store meeting. We have to role-play a sales scenario in front of everyone. He's playing the customer. When I ask for his fictional name, he responds with a term he picked up from our co-worker earlier that week. Mr. Duck Butter and explodes into a fit of giggles. Everyone else is silently horrified or confused. Asterisk, I'm selling a piece of nonsense washer dryer set to a landlord. I worked at a Best Buy situated across the street from an area routinely subject to candy busts and intense police scrutiny, as it is ridiculously ghetto. I pitched the landlord the service plan. He's not going for it, as his future tenants are likely too candy-addled to use the machines anyway. Duck Butter is standing by and decides to help me with my sale, employing all one month of his sales experience. In the most awkward and condescending manner possible, he proceeds to nag my customer the entire time I'm scheduling the pickup and processing the sale. Customer is visibly enraged and threatens to leave. Duck Butter finally concedes with, All right. Asterisk heavy sigh asterisk your funeral. Asterisk routinely disappeared throughout the day, only to turn up in random departments alienating customers. Coincidentally, did this every time actual work was involved. Had various ailments that prevented him from doing any physical task whatsoever, which ruled out any possibility of usefulness in appliance sales. Asterisk. As soon as he started working, our department got an influx of customer survey responses on how weird he was. He frequently had customers request to see another salesperson in the middle of his sales. The times I would go to check on his sale or take over, I would always be met with someone visibly uncomfortable or angry. Story 26. When I was 18 or 19, I worked in the stockroom at a retail store. One of the only other full-time guys was around 34, and by far the biggest pathological liar I've met in my entire life. Here are some gems. Asterisk. He was a Navy SEAL asterisk in boot camp. They would throw their parachutes out of the plane and jump after them. Asterisk. He played poker on a regular basis with Ron Perlman. Asterisk. His aunt was Betty Page. Asterisk. His uncle was Mario Andrette. Asterisk. At one point, just after Halo 2 had come out, he swore he had a demo for Halo 3 and told me he was going to give it to me. Knowing he was full of cow, I would ask every day just to see him squirm asterisk he drew cage for Marvel Comics. Asterisk won $10,000 at a Madden tournament in Hawaii, that's just a few. He also stole my iPod, then brought it into work a month later after Christmas claiming his wife bought it for him, even though the thing was obviously a used iPod. I never registered it, so I ended up cross-referencing my bank statement with the serial number's activation date and got his peach fired. A week later, he contacts me on MySpace and tells me his current girlfriend might be contacting me to ask about the circumstances of his job loss and asks me if I could please, please not tell her what actually happened. A sad, sad man. Story 27. Oh my God, we had one, John. He was a young guy at our tech company. First off, he was short, balding, wild-eyed, crazy ripped, and very Italian. He only worked for us for about six months, but here are some gems. Asterisk. He checked to as if a bathroom stall was occupied by slamming the door in, which usually just opened it on whoever was in there at the time. Asterisk. He collected soda bottles from all over the office because he wanted to make a soda bottle island like that one guy in the news a while back. Asterisk. John loved windsurfing and asked our CTO if he wanted to go windsurfing with him during his interview. Asterisk. He had terrible ADD and constantly fidgeted at his desk in meetings while walking around and muttering to himself. Asterisk. He loved Asian girls and would hit on every single one he saw in the office or out without any hesitation. He met a Japanese girl and eventually moved out there to be with her, and married, divorced her in a span of three months. Asterisk. He asked numerous people if it was all right that his girl's peach smelled like poop. Asterisk. I saw him randomly on the streets one day after he left the company. After he walked away, he turned around to wave bye to me and walked right into a light post.